Good evening, everyone. This is Jerry Smith, a broadband manager for the county, and um, we are ready to kick off our meeting. Uh, we're calling it a broadband forum, uh, broadband uh, city hall, whatever you want to call it, but we expect to have a good uh, exchange of information this evening and uh, appreciate everyone's effort to hang out with us for a little bit and talk about uh, a favorite topic of mine. Uh, I have been with the county since December and uh, have learned a lot about uh, the community. And uh, I expect to learn uh, some more good things this evening. Um, we, we do have a relatively small group. We have uh, four or five here in the room. And uh, on Zoom, looks like we have uh, more than that, but I think it's still small enough for everybody to go around and say hello. Um, so I, I have a few comments to make, but let's go ahead and go around and do introductions. Um, and we will uh, keep going on our uh, get going on our agenda. Basically, the agenda is is uh, we have a little bit of information to present to you. And then we'll have a set of questions at the end where you'll um, give uh, input. And I, I'd say we're flexible enough that if you want to stop us during our information, just uh, make make sure you speak up or, or chat. I think you're all able to speak in the Zoom as well. Uh, if you prefer to ask the question while we're presenting it, or um, you can save it for later. Uh, but I'll go ahead and uh, move to my uh, left, and we'll start with uh, Alan. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Alan Sainz, and I'm the owner of Los Alamos Network. And what I didn't say is if you're in a room, you have to press the button to get the green light on. So go for it. I'm Gary Stradling. I'm a White Rock resident, and I am a candidate for county council. I'm really, really interested in how we effectively do this, both legally and technically, and to get the to get really effective uh, coverage, broadband coverage for everybody in Los Alamos. I'm really interested in reliability and uh, and whether there are. Uh, are ways to make sure that we've got backup against failure, that kind of thing. I'm sure you're going to address all of those things. Go ahead, Gerald. My name is Gerald Baca. I'm the general manager of ReadyNet. We're an internet middle mile provider and internet provider in partnership with Los Alamos County. Thank you. I'm Marcus Halen. I'm a White Rock resident and just here to learn more about the broadband survey. Excellent. And um, we'll, we'll get you in a second, Patrick. Let's go um, with the um, Zoom participants. Okay. And if you want to help coordinate that. Sure. Um, so I'm Ann Laurent and I'm the deputy county manager. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, the chat function is not op, um, uh, enabled, but the raise hand function is. So if you raise your hand, we'll keep your RI out for those online. Um, so uh, Akana Peck and then Andy Frazier, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Akana Peck coming to you on slow DSL. So I'm very interested in this topic. Hi. Uh, in Uber in Phoenix, uh, and I'm uh, been interested in broadband for a long time. For the county, uh, set up a blog, labnow.blog. Uh, that's it. All right. Great, thank you, um, Anne and Richard Browning, and then Eduardo Santiago. Hi, um, so I'm the Richard part of it. My wife, Anne, is here too. We're mostly just listening. We're just uh, internet enthusiasts, I guess, is what you'd call us. Good 
Good evening. Um, Ed, Ed Santiago, just a resident, live on Barranca, very poor uh, network quality and just monitoring. Thank you for um, your presentation. Okay, um, we'll go to uh, Felipe Sanchez and then Roselle Wright. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Felipe Sanchez and I'm part of the CTC. So we are working in this project. So hopefully we get to help you to address your issues. I'm Roselle Wright. I live on Barranca Mesa. I filled out the survey, then I got the card that said to do the um, the speed surveys. I had to have the number on the back of the survey, which I'd already mailed in. So that's my first question, and then I'm listening to whatever you have to say. Um, we have CenturyLink. The it's good sometimes and not so good others. Excellent. We'll try to help you out with that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go to um, Jason and then Salvador. I'm Jason. I've uh, we have a house on Barranca, and then we're actually right now living in White Rock on Ridgecrest, and we have Comcast. And I don't think I got a survey. So I need to follow up with the email that says, hey, I need a survey. Hi, I'm Sal Zipian. I'm the director of technology for Los Alamos Public Schools. I live in White Rock and I am a happy, happy um, member of AlleyNet where I get my speeds. Okay, and we do have two additional attendees, um, uh, Jim, George, and Ruth, uh, and um, just encourage them if they'd like to speak at any point to raise their hand and we can enable them to, to do so. So, thank you. Very good, uh, that's a good group. Uh, thanks for everybody making the effort uh, on the Zoom and uh, it's a great uh, capability to be able to do that. Uh, even if your internet needs uh, some improvements, um, you're able to connect with us this evening. And uh, those that uh, were having uh, issues, I think uh, Roselle, I did get your email and we will get you the code so you can uh, do the sp uh, speed test and have it correlated to your uh, survey data. As, as a part of that. So I appreciate you connecting. And um, if for the information, uh, it, the survey is open to the public now and the speed test is open to the public now. Um, we need to get your email or if you're able to get to um, our website, uh, you should be able to find the link. Um, I don't know if we're able to chat that uh, to him, Anne, uh, but uh, we want ever. that's a part of our uh, promotion tonight is to make sure everybody's aware of the survey. And, um, and if you didn't, if you weren't on the original group that got the surveys, now it's open to everyone and we want uh, folks to do the survey and to do the uh, speed test as well. All right, let's move along. Um, in the agenda, um, I'm going to make a few comments and just kind of uh, give the lay of the land a little bit from my point of view, and um, and then we'll we'll kick off with uh, a PowerPoint with some slides. And uh, as I said, we want to present some questions to you and have you guys give us some feedback. Uh, that's uh, we want you to be a little bit informed, but we also want to make sure this is a uh, time that we're listening to you. Um, uh, we can all likely agree that high quality, reliable, and affordable broadband is a requirement in today's world. 
Uh, traditional providers have offered internet services that have been fair to poor. Uh, I think we, a couple of you mentioned that. Uh, not necessarily reliable and most often not necessarily reasonably priced either. Uh, it's not in those uh, companies' business model where the stockholder is uh, who they report to, to invest in new infrastructure in the local community, especially if things are working, quote, good enough. Um, thus, the community of Los Alamos finds itself with services that are no longer meeting the higher bar that we're finding ourselves in uh, as COVID has uh, made evident. Um, we're certainly left with incumbent providers who have shown little willingness to no willingness to invest on their own what is needed to make the improvements required uh, for now and for future use of the networks uh, in order to have services that this science community deserves and needs going forward in order to compete and thrive in the modern world. Over the last few years, many municipalities around the nation have found themselves in this same situation with incumbents that are dropping the ball. These cities and counties have successfully taken it on themselves to ensure new quality internet services are made available to every resident. The current funding environment, both state and federal, is such that there will never be a better time than now to do the hard work required to make the investments and improvements that will make Los Alamos an even better place to live and work. So we find ourselves here today at this meeting ready to consider together what uh, the, the items I've just mentioned and how that relates to your thoughts on the topic of how the county might lead out in broadband improvements, as well as sharing your own personal internet service experiences at your home or at your business. Um, I look forward to listening to you this evening. Uh, Patrick? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Mulhern. I'm the Director of Broadband Policy for CTC Technology and Energy. Uh, Felipe is on my team and I'm the project manager for this project. I'm overseeing uh, designing, engineering, and then uh, some samples for data collection purposes to help define the needs here in the county. Then to help uh, develop some options for some solutions and make some recommendations for uh, the county council to make some a decision. So um, if I may have the first slide, please. And, and as we're waiting here, if you um, make a public comment, if you uh, have a question and need to weigh in, please make sure to identify yourself. We are recording this. And then we're also uh, collecting all of the comments from the public to add to an, as an appendix to our report, which will be coming in December. So um, make sure you mention your name before you make, make your comment. You're welcome to speak as often as you like. Um, and then uh, we'll capture all that information and make sure it's made available to the decision makers. If I may have the next slide, please, Anne. So our agenda, we've done the introductions here. Um, I, 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 would like, I would like to get to the public comment quickly, but I wanna make sure that we have enough time to look at, it, at our, the project. Um, so we have a project overview. Um, I'll present some of the preliminary data that we've gathered, um, and then we'll discuss uh, some potential business models that um, will be refined somewhat as we make our recommendations to the council. Um, and then we'll have time for um, some back and forth. Absolutely want to hear all from all of you about your experiences uh, dealing with broadband. Uh, yes, sir. Is this briefing going to be available online? Yes, sir. We will make this deck available online. Okay, um, absolutely. And, and at the, the very end, um, I have a slide with uh, additional resources. And it's a link to the, um, the survey, the online survey, and a link to the speed test. And for those of you at home uh, who would like to know right now where to go, uh, um, lacnm.com, so your local government website, forward slash broadband survey, um, very easy to get to. Um, that's, that's where you can access the online survey. But again, I have a link in the PowerPoint and uh, we'll make sure to make that available to everyone so that you can have CR data and then also um, access these uh, online resources. And may I have the next slide, please, Anne? Actually, you can skip that one. Okay. 
So why now? Um, I say this a lot. We're, we're at an inflection point here in this country. Broadband, because of a lot of experiences all, all of us have had over the past three years, um, we now understand to be an absolute necessity. Uh, prior to COVID, I think there were a lot of conversations about, uh, well, the broadband and public utility, mostly at the regulatory level, should it be regulated like a utility. But now, on a very personal level, I think everyone understands just how important, how vital it is to have a stable, reliable, high-speed internet connection to your home. Uh, so not not the, the DSL isn't isn't sufficient anymore. Uh, a fixed wireless connection isn't going to cut it. What what are the options for better connectivity? And so we're having that conversation now. I think as a nation and at a very local level here at, as a county. Prior to this, and this is, I think, a testament to how forward thinking uh, the county is. In 2012-2013, the county commissioned a report uh, on how to develop a community broadband network. And the report had recommendations for infrastructure builds, for fiber to the premises, um, and some business model recommendations. The report's 10 years old though now. Uh, so we'll be working to, Updated in some respects, um, spinning off ideas from it and others, but there's there really is a, a finite amount of the universe for potential options for a community broadband network is small, and so our recommendations will very much I think be in parallel to some of the ideas that were presented in this initial report. Um, also, the the your community, the the county, the people who live in the county have been uh, very forthright in their opinions about how uh, broadband should be functioning here uh, for a lot of reasons, not, not the least of which being the, the, the technological savvy of the majority of people who live here. And then also the reliance on uh, high-speed stable data connections for things like education, remote work, and then also your experiences working in a field, in fields that require uh, more reliable high-speed data connections. I think uh, people see the need now, they see uh, what other communities have and they understand that there are, are deficits here that they would like to see filled. Um, following on that, the, the council, the county council has made broadband one of their strategic priorities there. Uh, a limited number of strategic priorities, obviously, not everything can be a strategic priority. Reliable broadband is a strategic, strategic priority for the elected officials in this county. Um, broader in the environmental factors that weigh in on this decision, on the decisions being made here last year, the federal government uh, passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, which defined broadband as, as critical infrastructure and at the same time set aside billions of dollars in funding for, for potential broadband projects. A lot of eligibility criteria that had to be met, but absolutely at the policy level, broadband has, has been, been placed central into federal infrastructure planning. Um, it's given it a, a, a different status than it has ever had before and being recognized as, as critical infrastructure. Um, and be, being given federal definitions and legislation um, have made it made it a lot easier for uh, local governments, in particular, to be a part of the policymaking process and ultimately influence how infrastructure is built. And then finally, um, not unique to New Mexico, although in my opinion, uh, New Mexico is, is farther along than a lot of other states. There's a lot of statewide planning going on right now for uh, where broadband infrastructure is needed, where it should go, and how it should get there. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not entirely unique in the country, but New Mexico is a lot farther along in trying to figure out a statewide plan, um, I think because the, the needs are so great here, um, but, but also people are spread out, um, and it's going to require a statewide plan rather than a regional or, or a municipal plan uh, to really provide connectivity to everyone. And so we're, we're trying to make, make it possible for Los Alamos to be absolutely at the table where these decisions are being made, if not central to the planning process. Um, if I may have the next slide, please, Ann. So this is our project timeline. Um, very 
wordy, my apologies, but you can see where in October here, we've deployed our surveys and speed test. Um, they're, they're available right now to everyone. Um, then uh, the survey closes on October 28th. Um, after that point, our survey team will start analyzing the paper surveys. The online surveys are obviously easy uh, to collect the data from, but we're processing all the paper surveys as they come in. Um, then we'll provide a report um, in December to the council uh, with the survey findings, present some options for business models, um, opportunities for grant funding, if there are any, uh, based on the data that we have and the types of projects that, that could be considered. Um, and then the council will decide uh, what the next steps should look like. That decision will then um, inform um, a request for proposals, which is like a real a real decision, a step that they're going to make into actually uh, solving solving the issues. Um, and then we'll develop, we'll take those recommendations, the, account, the council's preferences and build that into an RFP to release uh, early in the first quarter of 2023. And then if everything works out, we could expect designs um, for a project by the end of 2023. Um, if we get really lucky, we could even see builds, uh, construction starting, but uh, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of variables at play there. Um, I wanna make, make it clear though that this, um, this is not a, a report that's going to sit on a shelf somewhere and collect dust. We're providing um, actionable um, uh, options for the council, for the council to do something with the recommendations that we're gonna be making. Um, a lot of times governments do strategic planning exercises and the document is never implemented. The interest here is to actually implement a decision. Um, if I may have a, a, the next slide, please, Anne. So about our survey and speed test, um, very quickly. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, don't forget to identify yourself on the microphone, please. Given the small number of people, do you mind having questions? No, not at all. In Just your... make sure you identify yourself. I'm Gary Stradling. Uh, I, I have three questions that have come up in, in your comments. Uh, First of all, this report happened 10 years ago. What kept the county from doing something in the intervening 10 years? What, what is the history of that? Was it just, well, gee, that's interesting and put it on the shelf? I couldn't say. Ann, do you wanna? Uh, thank you, Mr. Stradling. I'm probably one of the few people that would have remembered that 10 years ago. Um, you know, there was strong interest in it at the time but it came uh, with a $60 million price tag. And that was a much far reach, further reaching number than it is in today's dollars. Um, and so I, I think we still looked at it as kind of a, it would be ideal, um, but I don't think that there was a, a, it, it, the, a viewpoint that it was financially feasible at that time. Okay, thanks. Uh, could I also ask, uh, and, and you can delay answers if this is if you're going to cover it later in your briefing. Uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory has tremendous uh, broadband transmission interaction needs. Is are you thinking about being in parallel with them as we are with like electricity and other things, or is this going to be separate from them? Does it make sense? to be partnering with the, with the laboratory? Um, that's a great question. Uh, this is Jerry Smith. Uh, the answer to that is we are having monthly meetings already with Lanel on the topic of, uh, one of one of the needs is for a second fiber optic line. We currently only have one fiber optic line uh, exiting the community and that's a problem for all operators, but especially one as critical as LANL. So they're highly motivated in that area. Um, uh, so I would, yes, we, and they are interested if we are able to uh, fund a second fiber optic line at being a customer or, or pursuing the project together with us. They have some funding uh, parameters and we have to work with those and try to get creative with them. Are, are we currently in tandem with them in any way or our current suppliers are independent of them? Um, 
like Comcast, do they come in on a fiber optic line that's the same line that Los Alamos Labs is using? Yes. I'll, I'll provide, anyone that's doing internet out of here that's using fiber optic is using the, the one line that the CenturyLink one. owns, correct? Okay. Uh, the third question related to this is, do we have transmission over, uh, over restricted land issues with our neighbors? Is that, is that part of our issue or is that not a problem? So, so running roads out of the county is an issue because we have neighbors who are restraining our use of, of their lands. Is that an issue for running uh, information lines? Uh, it has been an issue in the past, um, and there are conversations happening now with uh, some entities that are more interested in than they've been in the past at cooperating. Uh, if there is a mutual benefit to them, uh, that can be worked out. Uh, there are some applications for federal funding that are pending that could help um, some of those uh, partnerships move forward. Okay, thanks a lot. Good questions. Yes, thank you. No, that was a great digression and totally on point. And if anyone else has questions like that, by all means, just raise your hand or feel free to interrupt me. Um, this We have enough, a, a small enough group here that I think we can have an active conversation. And in the meantime, I will just go through my slides here. And if something piques your interest, please let me know. Um, so we, we were deployed two, two online tools or two tools, um, the speed test, um, which is uh, based on the New Mexico Department of Information Technology's um, backbone. So we're running through, they, they have isolated their speed test to stay on uh, New Mexico servers. And so it's all internal to the state. Um, also they're, because we're running through their, um, their backend, they're able to collect the data as well. And that will help inform statewide planning processes. Um, at the same time, uh, we've also deployed a survey. Um, the initial cohort um, of 4,000 went out um, at the end of September to make a statistically valid cohort for um, actual data collection. Uh, that initial deployment was both hybrid, it was paper and online. So you had the option of taking the paper survey you got in the mail. Um, or responding online and entering in um, a participant code so that we could uh, track your participation in that cohort. Uh, we've already received over 900 uh, responses. That's both online and in paper, uh, which pushes, puts us at about a 4% margin of error for our data collection. Uh, I think it's very likely that we'll meet the 1,012 that we'll need for a 3% margin of error. Obviously, the, the lower we, the smaller we can get that margin of error, the, the, the better, the, the, the higher the quality of the data is. And we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do with the data in a moment here. Um, then also, we deployed an online-only survey for everyone in the community to take. And that's the one that's at lacnm.com forward slash broadband survey. There's a link to this at the end of this uh, slide presentation, which you'll have access to. We recommend everyone take the survey, as many people that are interested, that wanna weigh in on this subject. All of the data will be collected. All of the anecdotal information, people's asides or comments will be collected and placed in our final report. Um, and we've integrated, uh, the, the statistical sample was integrated into the speed test site because you take a participant code from your online survey and enter it into the speed test. And then we match the speed test with the survey. Um, and I'll mention also this about the speed test, take the speed test as many times as you care to over and over and over again. We're trying to develop a, a large data set. Um, and I'll explain why here in a moment. Um, and all the surveys close on October 28th. So we still have a little, little bit of time left. I know that um, some of the people who are here tonight um, have contacted me uh, because either they didn't get their survey or they had some other issue with the survey. Um, I will be responding to all of you. Um, I have all of your contact information and um, I um, and is right. I do have your participant code, so I will get that to you so you can take the online survey. Um, as soon as I get back to my office, um, I'll be responding to everyone. If I may have... I'm sorry, yes. Uh, Connor Peck, Peck, you can go ahead and... 
Hi, I have a question about the speed test. I took the online survey when it opened to the public, and at the end, it directed me to a speed test site, which was run by the state of New Mexico. So I took that, but then I realized that wasn't the same link that I had seen in the local papers. So I went to that, and that one said Los Alamos survey, but otherwise it looked very similar. So I took both of them, but I mean, does it matter which one we take, the state or the county? Well, for, for our purposes, it would be helpful if you took the Los Alamos, the, okay. the one, the Los Alamos speed survey, although the data all ultimately goes to the same place. Um, but we, we are able to filter out for our purposes, the ones that are specific to Los Alamos, if you go through our Los Alamos survey. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Great. May the next slide, please. So what are we gonna do with all of this data? Again, I, I wanted to impress upon everyone that it's not just gonna go into a report that sits on a shelf. Um, we're gonna use the data, obviously, to inform a strategic plan, um, describing the actual community needs, um, and then leverage that to inform an RFP to build the community broadband network. Um, but this, these last two pieces, I think, are the most critical. Uh, the, and I'll, show, I'll speak about this data in, in uh, some of the following slides here, but for planning purposes, almost everyone, except for the state of California, but almost everyone relies on federal government's data set on speeds that are reported by the ISPs. So decisions about need are generally rooted in all of these reported speeds from the ISPs. And you can imagine that maybe those speeds aren't all that accurate. It's from a, a, a document called the Form, 4, Form 477. And ISPs report their uh, speeds to the federal government, and then the federal government makes policy decisions based on the, the speeds from the ISPs. Be part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, requires that the federal government update their broadband connectivity maps. And so they're requesting new information from all the ISPs about their reported speeds. At the same time, though, they're providing opportunities for local governments to uh, refine these maps, uh, refine uh, serviceable, serviceable locations so at the specific address level. So if you don't are or if you're unable to get Internet at your home, but the ISP says that you are, the local government has an opportunity to correct that. But the local governments also have opportunities to correct the reported speeds. And so the more robust data that we can collect on actual connectivity speeds in Los Alamos County will allow the county to uh, challenge some of the claims made by the ISPs and uh, refine this map. That will then be used to, de to define how eligible the county is for potential grant programs. So there's several uh, grant programs floating around the country right now coming up uh, from the federal government, billions of dollars in infrastructure and funding for last mile projects, projects to build fiber to your homes. Uh, in order for a jurisdiction to qualify for those, though, they have to meet a certain threshold of connectivity. The federal government has created two categories of connectivity now, define them in statute. There's an underserved portion and those are for addresses that can't achieve a 25 megabit per second download, three megabit per second upload, or underserved, which is uh, the, the upper, upper regions of that are 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload. So if we're able to describe the actual connectivity speeds in Los Alamos County as underserved, it then makes the county eligible for grant funding for broadband infrastructure projects. Yes, sir. Gary Stradling. One of the things that, have, that is ever present in our county is our relationships with our neighbors. Uh, we don't have many neighbors and, and those relationships are relatively important. So we have Santa Clara Pueblo, we've got San Ildefonso Pueblo, we have Española, and we have uh, folks who are living in the mountains around us. Is there, I mean, what, what sort of awareness and attention to those uh, uh, supplying broadband to those? I'm not suggesting that it's the county's job to do that, 
but to look for connections and and ways to facilitate and and uh, bolster those relationships. Can you talk to that? Uh, Gerald? Gerald Baca with ReadyNet. Um, ReadyNet uh, was almost being a, a owner member. Um, we also have owner members that are some of the tribes that you did mention. Santa Clara Pueblo, um, uh, not San Ildefonso Pueblo, but Pohuaque Pueblo as, as well. Um, they have had the opportunity for the tribal broadband uh, connectivity as well, federal funding through NTIA that many of them have applied for. Um, some have been awarded some of that federal funds and some are awaiting some funds. So they are um, aware of this and they are working on this as well. Uh, this is in parallel, basically very similar to what Los Alamos County is doing to where the tribal entities would become the internet provider for their local residents there on their tribal reservations. And then, and, excuse me, and Española, the city of Española has looked at this as well. Um, they have uh, received some funding from uh, Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez that was for a wireless solution to help bridge the gap to the wired fiber to the home type solution. Thank you. Of course, thank you. No, that's really great um, to know. What, but further to that, the state is actually the, the more appropriate entity to sort of knit all of these ideas together. So the state now has an office of broadband access and expansion with a director. And that director is talking about all of these regional projects and developing a strategy to knit them all together into a, a statewide effort to improve connectivity. So taking the local to the regional to the state um, is, is that new office's role. Does that information flow through the same physical infrastructure? Uh, I assume that it comes to Albuquerque and up, up through there or from somewhere, like, like a, an sure. information pipeline, but a physical entity. I mean, the, the, the lines of communication? Yes. Oh, yes. This, the, state, the state government communicates with local, local governments. Jerry is in communication with the Office of Broadband Access and Expansion. That, that, that's not what I meant. I meant the physical lines that carry the information. Oh, oh. Uh, topic. Um, there's two parts, basically, to fixing the internet problem. One is your connections to the home. We call that last mile. But the, what you're talking about is the middle mile, like how do we connect out? Exactly. And um, you, you touched on it, you did touch on it earlier, is how to get work with our neighbors to get connectivity beyond us. But it's even bigger than that. And the state is actually applying for funds to do more fiber. Currently, there is not much fiber. They, the state has the exact same problem that we have getting off the hill from Santa Fe to Albuquerque. There's only one provider there. And so that is uh, their application. They put in an application from the state to do more middle mile. Um, and uh, Gerald here with ReadyNet, uh, I think sub submitted applications for related projects. So there is a lot of work going on that the state is attempting to coordinate and actually part of their requirements in getting funding is they have to show that they're coordinating with us, with ReadyNet and with others in the state. So if I can follow on, so that sounds to me like single point failure vulnerability. Is that a situation that, that we have? Uh, it is one of the criteria to create resilience, uh, redundancy. So your point is well taken. Go ahead, Gerald. And that is what um, the Office of Broadband uh, uh, access and expansion is looking at is the resiliency and redundancy for the state. So not only the single point going from Santa Fe to Albuquerque, do we have the opportunity for a route from Los Alamos that goes around Hemes, Cuba, and, and comes in that way? Or do we have a route that goes up through northern New Mexico up into Colorado that creates redundant diverse paths? So that's what their office is doing. And they're coordinating very well on that, that as you put in an application, 
you do have to submit to them your map. That way, number one, uh, two entities aren't technically competing for the same area because then it lowers the odds of, of receiving the grant. But number two is the two entities are aware that they both are interested in that area and can potentially work together uh, instead of working against each other. Thank you. It's a complex uh, problem um, and there's not enough money, but that you have to be at least attempting to address the issues. And I think it's, again, I'll reiterate it, that this is a very advanced conversation in the state of New Mexico about how to make it all work together. Um, so uh, yeah, you've a lot of bright people thinking about regional statewide solutions as well. If I may have the next slide, please, Anne. Um, the next one, please. So our data, our, at least our initial data, um, is all pulled from these federal um, open data sources. For, so the, the, the Form 477. Um, and this, again, is how uh, policymakers are making decisions about uh, how, how and when and, and where to invest money in, in infrastructure. And so you can see that according to the federal data, there are no unserved areas in the county. Um, and then as you can see here, uh, there also aren't any underserved areas in the county. You can see where the, the, the population density is, and you can see also then on the right, and then you can see on the left uh, where the underserved populations are. And they aren't, they aren't in any of the, the urbanized or in, inhabited areas um, down in, um, in Los Alamos or White Rock. May I have the next slide, please? I'm sorry. I did not understand what you said. Are you saying that there are no underserved areas? According to the Form 477 data, that's, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. There are no, un, there are no unserved areas. I didn't even map them on here, although I do have those maps. And there are no unserved, but are we underserved or are we not underserved? There are also, according to this data, also no, no underserved areas. Um, wow. So you can see then the importance of, of the data collection that we're doing to the surveys and the speed tests, uh, critically important because th these policy decisions are being made currently based on this Form 477 data. These maps are being updated. And I, th I think it behooves the providers to provide more ac accurate um, information about the speeds that they're able to deliver at the address level, because then it makes them eligible for federal funding to build more infrastructure. It makes, makes business sense for them to tap the, the public money to improve their infrastructure. And so I think that it, it, it should encourage them to be more accurate in their reports, but we do just have to leave it up to them to make that decision unless we're able to affect the decision-making by collecting our own data and the county being involved in the process to improve these maps. Yes, sir. Gary Stradling again. So uh, do you also see data rates from the laboratory? I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are few, if any in the county that will tell you they see a hundred slash 20 megabyte per second performance in their systems. But I'm wondering whether the laboratory has uh, has a slicker system? No, no, we are engaged with uh, the residents of the county, um, so not not the national labs. So you don't know the data from, from the labs? They're not telling you? No, no. Okay. And so this is a little more focused, um, which is showing sort of neighborhoods. And there, there aren't a lot of, of areas where there are residences or inhabited structures, again, that according to the federal data set, can't achieve the 120 uh, definition of underserved. So you're sort of the canyons and low lying areas and some of the more mountainous areas, but where you have roads and houses, again, according to the federal data, um, there is service. Um, may I have the next slide, please, Anne? And so you see the various types of infrastructure. Um, we don't have, um, we don't have uh, um, fiber on here, um, but you can see how the, the connectivity is defined at least through these three uh, types of technologies. Um, obviously uh, people I, I've heard tonight are trying to connect on DSL. Um, DSL is everywhere, but um, 
I think that we can all agree that it's a, a, an insufficient technology for our modern needs. Uh, fixed wireless is everywhere. Um, relatively easy to deploy. It has some technological limitations, but um, for a quick um, and obviously sometimes a short term or an interim solution, um, it's a it's a great way to go. Um, and then cable is really, I think that the 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 cable infrastructure is is what really puts the thumb on the scale because technically, with a software upgrade, cable is capable of delivering up to a gigabit. Um, not symmetrical, but able to deliver up, up to a gigabit of uh, download speeds um, technically. And again, there are a lot of caveats with that, but the federal data doesn't allow for a lot of caveats. And so then you meet this level of service that looks like everyone in Los Alamos is perfectly able to access whatever broadband speeds they need. If I may have the next slide, please. The focus on uh, this DSL service availability. And the next one, please. Um, and cable again, where where everybody lives, they can access their Comcast cable and get whatever speeds Comcast says are available. And uh, the next one, please. Okay, so this um, is an infographic made by the New Mexico Department of Information Technology, and it is just packed with all kinds of interesting information. Um, on the left side, you can see they they graphed. Um, connection speeds. Um, you, if you are able to read the very small print and you have access to the PowerPoint slides, you'll be able to see them. Uh, th those speeds that they have graphed don't meet the definition of, of underserved. Um, they're, they're less than that. Um, but still, uh, the FCC this, and the, the speed data that they get, they have an, F an FCC on there, I'm not sure where they get the FCC data, but they're also using uh, data from Ookla, which is a very common uh, speed test provider, and MLab, which is uh, a, like a, a data analysis firm that takes um, their own samples and creates their own analysis of people's connectivity and speeds. Um, and then on the, the right side, you can see the, the reports from the Form 477 data, and those the top field where um, it says 1% uh, of the population uh, is underserved and is unserved and 4% of the population is underserved. Um, again, we're hoping to refine that to make a, a more accurate representation of people's needs in the county. Um, the field below that on the right, so the, the lower right quadrant um, are speed survey results, um, which are very interesting. And then the, the central uh, uh, data visualizations are all from um, another data set based on the US Census called the American Community Survey. Um, and it has a lot of very interesting demographic information on their uh, household income, but also the number of people who, uh, who, have a, who don't have a, a, um, a broadband subscription or how many people don't have a computer. Um, these are sort of um, other barriers to connectivity that the, the federal government has laid out. So it's not just about under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, it's not just about uh, do you have fiber to your home, but they look at other impediments to connectivity, such as device ownership or affordability, things like digital literacy, which is a very nebulous idea. But do you know how to do you know how to, to navigate the internet? Uh, can you set up an online bank account? Do you know how to send an email? All these very deep, uh, fundamental aspects of, of internet citizenship. Um, that a, a lot of people don't have. And, and those are obviously other Im impediments to people's connections. Um, so I, I recommend everyone uh, have a look at this thing. It's fascinating. Um, I think they've done a great job, like really a great job of encapsulating a lot of data in a very accessible form. Hey, Jerry. So I'm gonna point out, uh, I'm gonna point out uh, what Patrick was talking about on the right, almost the bottom is the speed test. If you remember the metric that said underserved threshold, that was 100 uh, download slash 20 upload. If, you, uh, if you're able to convince the authorities that your speed tests are valid, then we're, we qualify as underserved here. Just with this data already. Right. Yes. And so we need, and there's a thousand speed tests there that, that this data is coming from. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, the speed tests that you guys are doing, um, how we come out. 
which is, which is why we're encouraging people to take it over and over and over again, um, bump that up and, and provide a, a significant data set uh, that then uh, the county uh, can help influence how these decisions are being uh, described, how the map is, how the new maps are being drawn uh, to reflect actual needs. Because it, it, it this isn't an academic, ac academic exercise. If you have an, un, an underserved population, you are eligible for federal funding for infrastructure, period. So it's, it's critical that we are able to define the, the need in Los Alamos County in these, these very specific terms, um, because it's, it's, it's billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And oh, I would jump in too and add our neighbors probably qualify uh, for more than we do. So one strategy is to partner with them on applications. And that is something that um, we have made efforts at and we'll continue to make efforts at. And we're able, we already have relationships through our membership and uh, being a member of ReadyNet that a lot of those partners are already members of ReadyNet that we could partner with. Um, and Jemez, to the other direction, is a, a potential partner, uh, especially if the county, Sandoval County, uh, was willing to work with us on an application. And may I have the, um, the next slide, please? And then the next one. So we'll talk a little bit about business models um, and very, high level here um, for the next couple of slides i want to talk specifically about fiber because fi fiber is and i had to talk about it in one of these slides here um is the ideal um, infrastructure solution uh, for a lot of reasons it's it, it's not universally applicable in every situation but it should be it should be the the goal for all broadband projects at least in our uh, the, the CTC opinion about broadband infrastructure is that fiber is the gold standard. And so what is a very quickly a fiber broadband network do? Um, you have your over on the left, uh, the, the internet is that cloud. And it basically is just steps that internet, the data from the internet down, down, down through various um, bits of infrastructure into people's homes or businesses, uh, schools, on the right there, and it goes through this, my engineering team made this up. So if you're um, an engineer, I, go please uh, read this into detail. They, they wrote it for engineers. Um, if I may have the next slide, please. <clears throat> so currently, um, LANET has fiber. Um, that's uh, that's the, 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 the major fiber player. Our understanding is that CenturyLink, Lumen is, um, looking to expand their fiber, um, but it looks as nationally. though nationally, yeah. nationally, yes. But in Los Alamos, uh, they're uh, looking at new construction only. So not a lot of fiber uh, to the premises in Los Alamos. Um, and if you'll have the next slide, please, Anne. We feel that's a problem uh, because fiber is the future proof technology. Um, uh, we talked in an earlier meeting about the internet of things and how uh, everything in the house now is clamoring for a data connection. And really fiber pre presents an opportunity for infinite scalability. It can scale with a minimal infrastructure or uh, uh, hardware investment. Uh, the, the same infrastructure can deliver um, as much data as you need to deliver. Um, better network reliability than cable networks. So cable is everywhere. Um, and with a small upgrade to their software, they can deliver gigabit speeds, but fewer network issues with fiber um, and greater overall network uptime. So it's a lot more uh, reliable overall. Um, and then Hello. again, Hello. Uh, that's okay. Um, no problem. And then, uh, we start talking about competition as well and, and how. Hello. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Is he um, asking for an opportunity to speak? <laughs> I can't seem to keep myself unmuted. Uh, I've heard that uh, Comcast has fiber to every neighborhood. 
Uh, so, so there. Comcast has fiber to every neighborhood in the Um I'm, I'm not I'm aware. sorry that, yeah, uh, I shouldn't be talking. I'm in a. No, they, that's, I, that's news. Um, I'm not aware of Comcast fiber in the yeah, county. And so, and so I'm in an airport and I'm not going to comment again because it's so difficult. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, but if I, I don't, I'm not aware of any other fiber to the premises here. Comcast have a fiber. Yeah, he didn't necessarily no, 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 say it's not, it's fiber not to, to the, the premise. premises. It's, they've got fiber going to every neighborhood, they say, but not oh. available to the premises. Hmm. And uh, uh, th thank you, um, Andy. The um, I think that's true, and that's probably true everywhere there's uh, cable, is hmm. that it's fiber to a certain point, and then the rest of the network is the coax network. And the way they're able to improve their network is they get fiber closer and closer to the home. Um, there's no plans for them to actually put fiber into the home. Um, that's their biggest challenge. Um, they do have some plans for hardware and software upgrades that would try to squeeze more out of that. But their, their best way of getting uh, better improvements is pushing fiber further in the, in, into the neighborhood. So I would say his comment is true. So the, in, in those upgrades, then on the, the next point here, the, those upgrades um, are dependent on market forces. So um, as other competitors enter a market that provide better, more reliable services, uh, that tends to incentivize investment by the incumbents in improving their networks. And so um, it's one of those situations where uh, it, it, you can see the effects of competition on the products being offered. So it's another reason why it's important to just improve the diversity of, of, high, of reliable high-speed internet connections in the county because then everybody uh, comes up to that level of service. And then, of course, the community benefits overall uh, from a, a more diverse broadband economy. If I may have the next slide, please. And I want to jump in and say something that came to mind. Um, it, it'll be interesting to watch because Santa Fe, both Santa, the city of Santa Fe and the city of Albuquerque, um, who have Comcast uh, present as cable internet uh, and also uh, would have Lumen uh, DSL uh, all over the city. They just signed an agreement for a third provider to build out fiber to the home. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how their project uh, progresses and to see if Comcast decides to do anything to uh, combat the, mm. the new uh, entry into their market. So very quickly, um, <clears throat> there are really three different, I mean, obviously there, you, you can slice and dice these a number of different ways, but generally speaking, there are three general business models that can be followed when you're developing broadband infrastructure. Um, the, the first one is it's entirely public. So the publicly owned infrastructure, the, the, the government becomes the ISP and also delivers service on the infrastructure. Um, or the, 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 yeah, another one is the private infrastructure, private ISP, which is generally speaking what everybody in the country has. Um, and then the, the, the final one is um, the, the publicly owned infrastructure with private ISPs utilizing the infrastructure. So for the first one, the, pub, the fully publicly owned um, infrastructure and ISP, um, a lot of risk involved for the public entity. Um, also a lot of costs um, because it requires um, uh, internal capabilities that most governments don't have uh, just for building, operating, maintaining the network or things like uh, customer service representatives. Those sorts of things don't, a lot of governments don't have those assets. Um, and then of course you're investing public funds for the capital costs and also then for the operations and maintenance. So these grant programs that I've been talking about are, are for 
capital purposes. So to, for, for building the infrastructure, but there aren't public, there aren't federal funds or state funds for, to pay for the operations and maintenance. That's got to be made up some other way. Uh, hopefully with people subscribing to the, the public option. Um, but then if not, the money comes from somewhere else, there's a general fund or uh, a, a tax measure or, or what have you. Some, some ongoing uh, funding source makes that then viable. Um, then of course there's the risk. So the, the take rate is how many people does it take uh, subscribing to your product in order to make uh, your service at least break even to cover the cost of operations and maintenance. Um, and then, then what, how does a, a publicly owned ISP affect the, the, the market, the competition? Is, does it, is it able, does it undercut local providers? Um, is, it, is it able to compete with huge providers like uh, your Comcast or your at and Can it provide a product at a competitive price to, to even be um, attractive to people to get on that network? Um, so it's, it's complicated and, and risky. Um, then the one that we have the most, uh, the private infrastructure with a private ISP, uh, their projects are built where they can make their money. Um, so the, it's a, a profit-driven strategy um, where the return on investment, it, it, isn't, it isn't even just will they get their return on their investment. It's they want their return on their investment on a short horizon. So yes, you build the infrastructure even if you put a lot of money into it um, and people are spread out, if you give it enough time, you have those customers, they're, they're eventually gonna pay off your infrastructure, but um, they don't do, private ISPs don't deal in eventualities. They want a very short horizon for their return on investment, like 18 to 24 months. Um, and so they build where they can get that money. Um, and so they then build in urban or affluent areas uh, where people are willing to pay for it, uh, where their build costs are low, um, and so they can make their money back as soon as possible. And then the, the, the third sort of broad category of business models is the, the public infrastructure with a, a private ISP. Um, the good thing about this is the, the, the public entity gets to decide where the infrastructure goes. Uh, so defines where the needs are, who who's going, who needs it, who isn't getting it, and then can direct where that infrastructure is being built. Um, whatever other policy priorities or community needs there are can also be addressed then by the local government um, and make, in, can reflect the actual needs of the community. Um, you then the governments can, can decide what uh, what types of products are going to be sold. Uh, what sort of sorts of uh, low cost programs are going to be required for service over the network uh, can just decide uh, whether uh, there are neighborhoods that should be prioritized and built for that, that sort of thing. Um, because both partners in a public private partnership like this are investing their own capital. Um, it allows the government to help direct where the infrastructure goes. Maybe the government is able to tap uh, public funding sources to help build the project, um, but leaving the, the actual operations, even the maintenance uh, to an ISP that obviously has a lot more experience uh, delivering broadband to, uh, to homes, uh, how to manage a network, um, those sorts of things are, are obviously left to um, someone who has expertise. Um, and because both the public and private entities are investing together, uh, the risk is, is shared. Uh, so not only does the government get to direct where the broadband goes, but they aren't uh, holding the bag for all the costs. Um, uh, yes, sir. So the, the last uh, category that you have up there does that mean that the public infrastructure would go to a community and then uh, distribution from there would be a private entity or would it would they also take care of the of the last mile delivery to the uh, to the individual homes or is it just uh, uh, mix and match whatever whatever you eventually come up with that's right what, whatever agreement can be reached by the public and private entities it can be something like the the, the, the public entity owns middle mile infrastructure and then incentivizes um, other ISPs to build last mile or the, the, the public entity leverages public funds to build fiber to every home and then uh, contracts with a, 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 an ISP to operate and even maintain the network, deliver services on there. Or they could even 
uh, contract with an entity to just manage the open access network, then that, that entity negotiates with all of the various providers that might like to use that network. Um, so there are, there are a whole host of, of permutations on, on how the relationship might work out, and it really is should be a reflection of the, the, the local needs and then the other the, the players that might be interested in being involved. So if, if we could just so this is inverse a little further on that. Uh, it used to be that every home in Los Alamos had a telephone line going to it. Yes. Those lines are still there, but uh, they're, they're twisted pair of lines. And they probably don't have high bandwidth. Uh, but it used to be that we had distribution to every home. We do that for, uh, for gas and electricity. Are there any ways without actually digging a trench for each house to get that distribution now? Now, I, I, I investigated getting wireless in my home in Red Rock and uh, was unable to get access because there's no line of sight to the transmitter that gets in Red Rock. But what are the options there? Are you going to go into that in detail? Should I just leave the question? No, well, no, not, I, I will not tonight go into that level of detail, but our report is, is well, we, part of our report in December is going to include a, uh, high level design and cost estimates. So how, how to deliver fiber to the home and how much it could potentially cost uh, using various uh, uh, strategies. So uh, underground or aerial or aerial and underground depending on the needs. Um, so it, it depends on topography, it depends on the, on the composition. All right, so this is Andy Fraser. Um, again. Andy, if you could, I've got you next. Okay, if you can hold on. Um, so there, there, there are a lot of factors that that influence that decision. Is essentially what I was going to say. So thanks, Anne. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, uh, ways of setting all this up is I would very much like uh, the county to own uh, the fiber so that uh, in the future we're guaranteed that we're not stuck with a, a monopoly again that's not publicly owned. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, his, his preference would be for the the county to own the infrastructure so that uh, you're not beholden to um, a monopoly in the future, which, I mean, that that's a decision for the council to make. Um, but we have seen a lot of success in public-private partnerships like that. Um, and and I think one of the reasons why the 2012-2013 the, the report was never really implemented was because there wasn't a financial model that would support the build, certainly not the operations and maintenance, but now there's all these, there's all of this money available for, for infrastructure projects for broadband, specifically targeted for governments to, to, able to use. So we, you're not dependent upon ISPs to build the stuff. There's, for the project? For last mile distribution. Oh, oh I'm, I don't know, my design and cost estimate isn't complete yet. Um, but that's part of that's part of what will be on our report in December will be the full design um, and what we anticipate. It's a high level design and a cost estimate based on a high level design. Millions, ten, tens of millions. So this is a good time for me to point to the poster on the wall. Uh, those of you on the Zoom won't be able to see it, but I posted a map of the county owned fiber that didn't exist be when we had the Cristino report. So the cost that um, was pre presented then as an estimate was 60 million, um, which is a lot of money, obviously, but there is a lot of fiber that exists now that didn't exist then that it, we'll just have to wait and see if what the uh, project costs will come out to, taking into account that there is a lot of fiber around the, uh, the, the uh, town of Los Alamos and some around White Rock, uh, but the majority of neighborhoods there is not. So um, I just wanted to add that into that things, we're definitely in a different environment than we were uh, in 2012 and 13. There's a lot of interest. There's also a lot of funding available. Uh, and there's also a lot of creative problem solvers 
mm -hmm. uh, submitting bids to do these kind of projects. That last piece is critical mm -hmm. too. You have a lot of a lot of creative people thinking about novel solutions to these problems, and they're all right in this area. So um, I think the prospects are good for a, a, an an interesting solution to the problem to to be decided upon. Um, if, if I may, have the next slide, please. Before you go there, yes, sir. In the map, you have a number of different kinds of fiber lines laid out. Would you mind just stepping through what those different lines are and what, what it means for them to be different? You've got 144 and 288. Yes. And you've yeah. got the underground concrete. What it, I mean, the, the basic essence of it is that it doesn't really mean anything to you because it's just fiber and they'll all connect with each other. It's more of a documentation map to say, well, how much fiber, 144 is a number of strands that are inside of a jacket. And um, there is another map that shows how many of those are available to use for the network. And there are basically every drawing, I mean, every line there, there's pretty much spare fiber uh, strands available. And the distribution, the last mile distribution options for delivering to houses in the county from each of those endpoints, those nodes on that fiber, what options are there for that? Is it, uh, is it wireless? Is it running a fiber cable to each door? What, as, as you're doing your planning for the December report, what is that gonna look like? That's, well, it'll depend on certain environmental factors, topography, soil type availability of, of uh, um, public utility infrastructure that might be used. So running aerial over existing um, electrical wires or are, is there conduit available, um, which there is a lot of conduit available as well. Um, and if it's, if it's somewhere that's topographically challenged, challenged or cut off from the, the major fiber networks, well then, then a wireless option would be, would be considered for that. Um, but we'll have a, a mix of, of design options in there that will include some piece of each of those types of delivery methods um, in the design and cost estimate. There's some parts of the county that will just have to be wireless, at least for the, for the, the interim. Um, again, our goal is for everyone to have fiber, um, but the, the, the network opportunities, and really that's what this is. This is a map of, of opportunity. It shows how, how much capacity already exists um and one piece that uh, that that exists now that didn't exist in 2012 was there's a, a fiber connection between los alamos and white rock um that is that can be leveraged to provide the to, to make the community broadband network a reality um, but our design will will include fiber to every home and where infeasible we'll have some wireless connections And so here we are, uh, we are all like getting close here. Did you talk about the RFP? Like, so- I'm oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. What these guys are gonna present in December is their take on it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we design an RFP that requests bids and it might have some wireless options built into it, but you'll have providers that'll bid fiber to every home. And then you just do comparisons and see how, uh, see how things work out. So RFP process will be valuable. So you, you maybe are envisioning a team of providers that, uh, that work together to supply all of the needs of Los Alamos. You're looking for uh, a single entity that uh, you're going to just hand the project over to. Yes, that's the decision. The, the answer is all the above. I think you consider every option. Um, now, at some point, it might not be worth dealing with 10 providers or builders. Is, um, but you, you'll send out on the RFP, uh, you all get together and figure out how you can best work to provide for Los Alamos. You, you can and have, some people will say, me, 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 and some will say, we as a team will accomplish this. Exactly. Okay, good. Okay, so here we are, how you can help. Um, everyone take the speed test and the survey. Um, 
tell all your friends, tell all your neighbors, take the speed test and the survey. Um, we are opening, um, if people have other public comments they would like to make, we are capturing all that um, next. Um, and then when this comes before the council, make sure that um, your opinions are heard there as well. Um, if I may have the next slide, please, Anne. I have one here. Uh, yes, and if I may make a comment, um, that's the goal for the December council meeting. I just need to get, give a caveat that at the end of the year, with time running short, you know, there's always a potential for changes in the schedule, but I just want to make sure that everyone knows that's our goal to get to council in December. That might push to January if circumstances um, arise. So be, be, be paying attention, um, but we'll try to provide notice um, when it's coming, if that's something that is of interest to the community. Um, it seems like it's something of interest, but um, will definitely help promote um, this decision when it's coming up so that you can see what the designs are, see what the options are, uh, see what the survey results are, which I think might be very interesting. And so here, um, questions that we have, um, I don't know if anyone would like to respond to any of these, but we're, these are run parallel to some, to some of our survey questions. Um, what people's experience with broadband in Los Alamos are um, poor internet performance or data deficiencies um, that you've experienced and how that's uh, sort of negatively affected uh, your life or your career or uh, students in your family. Um, how involved do you think the county should be in um, improving broadband connectivity? Um, big question. Um, and then uh, in your opinion, what's the ideal outcome for the community broadband network? Um, and again, we're capturing all this information. Um, all these comments will go into our final report. Um, so this, this is an opportunity for you to weigh in um, and be heard. And uh, I'll jump in and say, we have plenty of time. We had scheduled till seven, uh, actually till seven, I was thinking 7.30, but so, we have three minutes if you want to finish on time <laughs> very quick, or we can keep talking. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I spoke before uh, I realized I was wrong. Uh, so we were set to finish at seven, but I'm going to keep sitting here. So uh, jump in, please. Um, and you guys in the room, just jump in. Uh, we have had good discussion already. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and I see. Uh, Akana, Ms. Peck. Uh, Ms. Peck, go ahead. Hi. Um, I wasn't necessarily going to answer those questions, although I can, but I wanted to ask a question that wasn't covered by the presentation. You mentioned conduit at one point, and um, somebody a few months ago asked the transportation board whether they're whether the county could institute a policy of always putting in conduit when they do road work. For instance, down here in White Rock on Sherwood, they've been, there, there's there been a huge project, the street's been torn up for six months or something like that, and they're not putting in any conduit. And it seems like it would be a very low cost solution to be working on that while we prepare for the longer term. You know, hopefully we'll get fiber installed, but, we could do it cheaply if we had the conduit in place already. So I wonder what we have to do to, to make that happen with the county. Um, so Ms. Peck, I'll, I can answer that and Jerry can chime in if he wants to. Um, so that is something we've implemented where um, Jerry is on our review committee of projects and helps evaluate um, the potential and costs for trying to put in conduit whenever we can. And I know the Department of Transportation has implemented new policies about being willing to put in um, uh, high-speed internet conduit where in the past they were not. So that's great. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I will say sometimes when we're over only doing overlays or when the fiber, um, the connection is super far away, um, there's sometimes a hesitancy that, you know, not knowing when it will get there and not knowing if that, inf that conduit will still be usable by the time we get there. So it is a little bit, um, there are more factors than just um, whether or not we 
uh, the cost is initial cost is there, but um, your point's well taken that broadband is a priority and we're doing everything we can to make it a priority with our projects. Great. So, so now after Sherwood, um, anything later than that, there will be conduit installed generally? I, I think that's what you said, but I oh, wasn't sure. Yeah, generally the, it's being evaluated and um, implemented whenever feasible. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. This is Gerald Baca with ReadyNet. Along that lines, the state and other counties and communities have looked at that in the dig once policy is if it's going in, if it's being trenched, that that's where it, it is, as you mentioned, feasible and cost effective to install conduit with future planning. But of course, in Los Alamos with its uh, rocky terrain and environmental, that's where a lot needs to be considered on that. But I just wanted to mention that other communities are looking at that as well. Ms. Peck. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, are we just one last slide. Um, it's just uh, what, what we're doing next is we'll, can, we'll finish the surveys, analyze the data, present the report to council. Um, that report's going to comprise all these things. Um, the data we've collected analyze some grant opportunities, um, include a high level infrastructure design and cost estimate, uh, some potential business models that could be considered. Um, and then all of that will inform an RFP for building the community broadband network. Um, and if I may have the final slide, please, Ann. So again, this uh, presentation will be made available to everyone, uh, clickable links for the broadband survey um, and the speed test. So um, feel free to uh, take those or take a screenshot now of the, the links so you can see them or write down uh, the, the URLs so you can access them at a later time. And then we'll work to get this up on the, um, on the broadband website at the county. And if there are no other questions or comments, um, thank you for sticking around. Yes, sir. Um, Andy right Fraser again, and I uh, want to compliment you all. You seem to have a really good grasp of the issues and uh, looking for the, a good path forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it helps having um, smart partners in all of this, actually. So um, I just let everyone shine. Uh, but thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks everyone. And um, we got uh, one more hand. Ms. Peck, Ms. Peck, Go ahead. Ms. Peck, are we? Oh, it's, it's okay. I was just going to agree with Andy. I thought this workshop was really great. And I'm really encouraged to hear, you know, how on top of it you are. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.